Hi, today I want to give a brief introduction to microfinance. A good place to begin is the book, Portfolios of the Poor, How the World's Poor Live on $2 a Day. The author studied approximately 250 poor households living in slums and villages in Bangladesh, India, and South Africa. And every two weeks, they went to these households, interviewed them, they computed balance sheets and financial flows to get a more micro-accounting of the financial lives of the poor. And they discovered several things, which some of which were quite surprising. Perhaps not so surprising is that the poor are subject not simply to low income, but also irregular and unpredictable income flows and also needs. So the world's poor don't live on $2 a day. They live on $1 a day, on $3 a day, on $0 a day, and so forth. Very irregular income flows. Also, needs are irregular. Some days you're sick, you need to go to the doctor. Another day the bicycle breaks down and you need to pay for a new wheel. Another day the cousin gets sick and needs help, and so forth. So how do the poor manage this unpredictability? In economics, we often talk about consumption smoothing as a reason to save and borrow. Well, for the poor, consumption smoothing, it's about eating every day. It's about getting a meal. It's about not falling below the death line. So because of this, consumption smoothing is a very, very important and real aspect of the lives of the poor. And because of this, it turns out the poor make quite sophisticated use of a number of financial mechanisms which are available to them. In addition, savings. The poor save quite a bit. They save quite a bit of their income in order to smooth out their income, in order that they are able to eat every day. Here's an example. This is Pumza's cash flow. Pumza is a woman. She lives in South Africa. She has four children. She makes her money by uh, buying sheep's intestines and cooking them and selling them uh, on the street to passerbys. What you can see is that the revenues from her business are really very variable. You know, some days it rains, for example, so she's not going to get a lot of passerbys. Her expenses are also variable. Sometimes when it rains, she knows to buy less, so her expenses fall along with her revenues. At other times, however, here and here, you can see that her expenses exceed her revenues. And at these times, she goes to a money lender, perhaps, for a brief loan or she uses funds from a savings club. Pumza, in fact, belongs to eight different savings clubs. In fact, Pumza, as well as many of the other people portrayed in portfolios of the poor, they use the financial system a lot in different ways. So there is relational finance. They borrow and lend to family and friends. There are remittances, both from abroad, from other parts of the country. Again, people send and receive remittances. There is borrowing and lending in money, but also in kind. People will borrow a cup of rice from their fellow villagers or from people who, near, who live nearby them in the slum. They use Roscas and CHIT funds, Rotating Savings and Credit Associations. That's one of these savings clubs we were talking about here. We'll talk more about those in a future lecture. They use micro lenders, store credit, money lenders, cell phones, particularly in recent years, transferring money on cell phones, even banks and savings accounts. Particularly some banks and postal savings accounts do cater to the poor, though there's not enough of them. In any case, what you could see here is that precisely in order to manage these unpredictable flows and also needs, the poor make use of the financial system in a lot of different ways in whatever is available to them. We're going to be talking about microcredit and micro savings and insurance and Roscas and CHIT funds more in future videos. I want to offer here just a few cautions about microcredit because microcredit has gotten a lot of press recently, including a Nobel Prize, a deserved Nobel Prize in one way, and microcredit is certainly important. But we have to keep a few things in mind. First, microcredit is just one of many financial tools that the poor use and have access to. Also, we have to remember that the flip side of microcredit is micro debt. Just think about the subprime crisis in the United States. A lot of credit looked good until it turned into a lot of 
debt. Also, the vision which we're presented with microcredit is of poor entrepreneurs uh, creating these new jobs and growing in that way. But in the history of the world, countries don't become rich by creating a lot of micro-entrepreneurs. They typically become rich by industrialization, by creating a lot of jobs. The poor are often entrepreneurs by circumstance, not by choice. Or as David Rudman in Due Diligence puts it, micro-enterprise helps people to survive poverty more than to escape it. What people really want is a salaried job. Consider how difficult your life would be without a regular job. The thing about a regular job is you can go to work, have a bad day, not get a lot done, and at the end of the week you still get paid. So a salaried job is a great form of insurance. It's a type of credit and a type of insurance in and of itself. Now, the big advantage of microcredit has been in efficiency and reliability. The poor, by and large, can trust microcredit institutions to work. Not always. There have been some instances of corruption. But by and large, the system works and it's low cost. The issue is, is how to create low-cost ways of improving access of the poor to other financial services, including micro-savings and micro-insurance. In some ways, this is the next wave. Consider, right now, the poor in many countries actually pay to save. Unlike in developed countries where people are paid to save money, in less developed countries, poor people actually pay to save. This illustrates that there is a big opportunity both to benefit the poor and to create a more efficient savings system in developed countries. Thanks very much.